Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Fabio Castelli. I'm the, one of the engineering managers working on uh, SUSE CAS uh, platform. I'm also taking care of uh, the team that is working on, on container technologies at SUSE. So today I'm alone. Marco Vidovati was supposed to be there with me as co-speaker, but he's uh, injured since quite some time, unfortunately, he's getting well but he was not in the good shape to, to travel here. So I'm not the expert of Kata containers. I know a bit about it. I did my best to, to learn about it in time, but um, let's see, let's see if you have tricky questions. So um, let's start first of all with, uh, with the name Kata containers can be a bit misleading, you know? Maybe you think this is a new kind of uh, Linux containers. This is not, this is just a different way to run the, the usual Linux containers you are already used to. Um, you are go we are going to talk about application containers today. Okay. Application containers, as you know, they are defining a new way to deploy uh, applications. You, you take your application, you package back into the container, and you have something that is portable that can be moved across different environments, different architectures, um, sorry, different platforms, and something that you can run in a consistent way it allows you to be uh, <clears throat> to be sure that what you're running inside of the cloud is going to behave in a pretty close way to how it behaves inside of your computer, on-premise, on domain on health, whatever. So these are the selling points of application containers. But let's look a bit uh, deeper into what do we actually need to run a container. Basically, you, you need two things. First of all, you need a container image. The container image is just made by your application. Your application is going to have some dependencies in terms of libraries, programs. So you usually start with a minimal OS, which is tailored to the purpose of your application. And you wrap everything up into a so-called image. The image then is consumed by a container engine. The container engine will download the image from a location, a container registry. And then it will spawn a container based on the image with the configuration that you requested it to use. Uh, containers have standards. This is a really important thing. This is a key point because it allows us to avoid vendor locking, to avoid fragmentation, <coughs> and to do um, in exper experiments, to do uh, new, um, new container runtimes that we will see pretty soon. So everything is uh, following two uh, specifications that have been produced by OCI, Open Container Initiative, which is a project underneath the Linux Foundation. So this is probably a member of it. We, we have also one of our guys who's a, a TOC inside of OCI, so participating in two technical discussions. As I mentioned, there are two um, specifications that were, were produced by, by OCI that I highlighted in green. The first one is about uh, image specification. The image specification defines how a container is actually uh, built, uh, how it is uh, structured inside. A container is a, is a binary blob that has the root file system, it has your application, libraries as I said, but it also has some metadata inside of it. For example, who is the maintainer, what are the ports that are used, the volumes that are used, uh, the entry point of it, comments, all the kind of things. Everything is covered by the image specification, and that allows uh, different type of projects to, to be able to build container images. Um, I don't, so this morning I had a talk about uh, containers feature, and I briefly talk about these aspects. So there are different ways to produce the so-called OCI images. OCI images are what Docker is consuming, so you're already using OCI images. You most probably build your images using something like Docker. So there is Docker build that builds an image. We're going to introduce new tooling inside of the containers module during the next uh, year. This new tooling comes in the form of Podman, which is a drop-in replacement of Docker. It comes in the form of Builda, which is a tool that is designed to create uh, containers. Uh, there you have Mochi that you probably never heard about it, but it is a tool that uh, we are using, for example, inside of Kiwi, and it is a tool that is um, shaping a bit uh, the image specification uh, in terms of um, we are driving a lot of development around the libraries that are part of OCI by, by 
pushing forward uh, for more cheap. So uh, all these tools, they are here, and they all produce uh, image that are following this specification. That allows you to take this image and then run that with any kind of container engine that then is following the second specification, which is the runtime specification. The runtime specification describes how um, a container runtime can be invoked. What is the API that it has to expose? What are the data structures that have to be used during this communication? The, the goal here is um, to allow everybody to create new runtime uh, implementation based on the specification that can consume standard images. So OCI, while working on the runtime specification, also came up uh, with the reference implementation of it. It is called RunC. How many of you have heard about RunC? All right, good. So if you're using Docker, underneath you're using RunC because Docker is calling container D and container D is calling run C. So you're already using run C to run your images. Podman is using run C as well. Um, I would talk about Cryo as well, which is uh, a container runtime uh, for Kubernetes. It's using run C as well. So this is all thanks to, uh, to this standardization process. These are some, some logos, basically there is ContainerD, Docker, Podman, Cryo, they all rely on top of RunC, which is a runtime for containers. So the takeaway lesson here is that uh, thanks to the image specification, I can take a container image and use that with different container engines. It could be Podman, Docker, Cryo, it will keep working. Thanks to the runtime specification, and this is the interesting part, I can swap the container runtime underneath the container engine. So I can take uh, Docker and uh, instead of using RunC, use a different uh, runtime and everything is going to be working the same way. There might be some minor differences, but there is, it's just a configuration change inside of the text file. And this is a powerful concept, as we will see. Before we talk about uh, Kata containers, Kata containers inside of the title we mentioned bringing security to the next level. So let's talk briefly about uh, container security because this is a complex topic. So containers, traditional containers, they are just processes that are running on top of your machine, on your host. They are sitting next to the other processes of your machine, but they are uh, jailed some way, they are containerized, and this is all done using features that are built into the Linux kernel. So you have namespaces to provide isolation. You can have, for example, a network namespace per container, which means that each container is going to have a different network stack, different IP, for example. You can isolate them from the process point of view so they do not see other processes running on the same machine, and so on and so forth. There are several namespaces. And then you can use uh, C groups, which is yet another feature built into the kernel, in order to control the amount of resources that can be consumed by the containers in terms of CPU, I.O., and so on and so forth. There are some security threats using containers because um, the isolation between the containers and the host is pretty thin. They are using the same kernel, they are using security features built into the kernel, they are using uh, a container runtime that might have issues, like recently there was uh, and run C pretty severe CD that we found at Susan and, and fixed upstream that made quite uh, the news. So whenever there is this kind of issue, when, whenever there is this uh, kind of exploit, the attacker can find himself inside of the host system. And if you're not doing things in a secure way, he can find himself running as root on your security system, which is a nightmare from a security point of view, of course. So what can you do? Oh, to reduce uh, the attack surface. So first of all, you can try to use uh, Linux capabilities, which is a way to strip away uh, privileges from processes. If your application is not, for example, doesn't need to CHO in files or directories, you can strip away this uh, capability from the process. You are stripping away all the capabilities that are not needed in order to reduce the attack surface in order to reduce what an attacker can do in the case he escapes from your container. The next thing you can do 
which I have to say is pretty complex, you can write a second profile that is going to block all the system calls that your machine doesn't need. So does your machine need to bind to, uh, sorry, your container, does your application running inside the container need to bind on, uh, on the socket? If not, you can strip away this, uh, this syscall and then reduce what an attacker can do. And finally, this seems to be, you know, it seems trivial, but there are a lot of containers that are running uh, application instead of them as root user. I, I don't think you're running Apache on your machines as root, but if you are not careful, you can end up doing that with a container, running Apache instead of the container as root user. So this is uh, something you have to pay attention to. When something goes wrong, there are different ways that uh, you can uh, use in order to reduce the, the damage an attacker can do. So you can run your containers using user namespaces. This is a way to map uh, UR root inside of the container, but this root user is mapped to an uh, unprivileged user inside of, uh, inside of the host machine. And so if he escapes from, uh, from the container, he will find himself on the host as user <coughs> a really high UID that can't do that much in the system. At the same time, you can also empower uh, policies like SC Linux or App Armors that are going to limit what the user can do uh, after he escapes from the, the container. For example, does your application need to write uh, or read under, etc.? If not, you just strip it away and the attacker won't be able to, to mess around with, etc., uh, shadow, password, whatever. So uh, this is also good for auditing. So these are all techniques that you're going to empower to, again, try to be more secure. The ultimate level is to run uh, all your containers inside of traditional virtual machines. So you create a VM, and inside of this VM, you're going to spawn your containers. Uh, you, by doing that, you get an extra layer of protection through the hypervisor. And if you think about that, this is a really common deployment scenario. All the containers running inside of the clouds, they are actually running inside of virtual machines. So this is pretty nice, you might think, and it is, but this is not really flexible. Let's say that you have to run uh, mixed workloads. Some workloads, you trust them. Other workloads, you do not trust them. So you could, for example, say, I'm going to provision a bunch of virtual machines, and these virtual machines are going to be allocated only to run untrusted workloads. That will work, but this is not uh, the best usage of your hardware, because maybe you have these machines provision and you have very few untrusted workloads in, inside of them, so they are basically idle. You could make a better usage of your machines. And at the same time, you will always have some trusted and untrusted workloads inside of the same machine. Think about Kubernetes. Kubernetes has its own network fabric deployed via uh, containers using uh, CNI plugins. So inside of each machine, even the one that are going to run untrusted, um, workloads, you will have uh, stuff like Flamel, Cilium, Calico, whatever, that is running containerized, and so you are still mixing this kind of workloads together. Finally, of course, hypervisors have security bugs as well, but I mean, we have to, to cope with that. For its security is a matter of layers one over the other to, to just reduce the attack surface and, and the damages afterwards. So how does Kata play into, into this picture? So um, Katam is a project that was uh, born a bunch of years ago, 2017. It's uh, the merge of two upstream projects. It was uh, Intel Clear Containers, and there was from Hyper there was RunB. They merged together under the Kata project, which is now reporting to the OpenStack Foundation. And to, to make it extremely simple, with Kata, you're wrapping up containers. Each container is wrapped into a tiny VM that is highly optimized to reduce boot time and to reduce memory footprint. How is implemented? This is implemented by following the image runtime specification, meaning that Kata is going to provide you something like RunC, all right? And for you, it's just a matter of changing a configuration line and say, Docker, I don't want to run containers using RunC, I want to use uh, Kata Runtime. And the same you do with Podman, uh, with Cryo, 
and it will just uh, work. You don't have to rebuild your images, you don't have to change the way you distribute your images, everything stays the same. There are tiny differences, of course, but everything almost stays the same. So how Kade is built, so let's spend some time over there. So there are different um, components that are being used by Kata. In the following slides, we dig uh, deeper into them. But right now, for example, let's start from the basics. So how do we create a container? So you have your container engine over there. Let me use a pointer. So you have your container engine over there. And you say, I want to do a Docker Podman run of BusyBox. And you, I want to do that using Kata. So the first thing that happens is that Docker, Containerd, Podman, or Cryo, instead of talking with uh, Run C, they talk with the Kata runtime. The Kata runtime <coughs> is running on the host and is going to set up the VM here. It's going to create this VM that is going to boot up. Inside the VM, we have a kernel that is optimized to, uh, to not take care of emulating of not supporting a needed hardware. So it's a stripped down kernel that is focused on, on booting up fast and not using too much memory. The kernel will boot up, where you will have systemd running inside of the VM, and systemd will just start the kata agent, which is going to be there waiting for further instructions. The runtime is going to talk with the agent and with a simple configuration, like the default one, is going to do uh, the communication by using the kata proxy. The kata proxy is there, multiplexing input and output from uh, the kata agent down to the host. So the runtime, we talk with the agent and we tell, I want to run BusyBox. And so the agent will take care of spawning a pod. And instead of this pod, it will spawn the BusyBox container. For the ones who are not familiar with pods, pods is just a concept that comes from Kubernetes. It allows you to group different containers together inside of, uh, let's say, a group. Uh, containers are isolated by namespaces and by C groups, as I was mentioning before. Containers that are running inside of the pod that do not have certain isolation features by design. For example, they share the same network namespace, which means that uh, all the containers inside of the same pod, they have the same IP address. Um, why is Kata taking care of that? This is a requirement because if Kata wants to be able to, to be consumed by Kubernetes, it must implement this concept of Kubernetes. So, to go back, your container engine will talk with Kata runtime that will spawn up a VM. Instead of the VM, the agent will then start the container. From this point, uh, the runtime is done. Uh, how many of you have ever heard about or so container D shim running on their machine? Do you know what it is? Mm. All right, so basically, uh, once the container is running, you have some processes, one per container that is running on your host. If you're using Docker or container D, you have container D shim. If you're using anything that is based on libpod, which is the library that is at the heart of uh, Potman, uh, Builda, and Cryo, you will have uh, another process called Conmon. This is the process that takes care of forwarding signals down to the running containers. You want to terminate the container, there must be someone who, who sends it a SIG term and after some time a SIG kill. This is uh, container D shim or Conmon. They're also called uh, container reapers because of that. They are also used to do more uh, nicer ways compared to killing containers. They are used to um, to exchange streams. They take care of taking out the standard output. So whenever you start streaming the logs of the container, this is something that is done by Conmon or Containerd to get access to them. Or if you have running an interactive session, again they take care of the standard input. So these uh, shims they have to be able to talk in the Kata container world, they have to be able to talk with the container that is running inside of the VM. So to do that, of course, they have to go through the agent. And to, do, to go through the agent, they have to talk with the proxy. But all these concepts are, you know, the Kata proxy, 
is something completely unknown to continuer deletion and Kahneman. This is something specific to Kata. So to solve this problem, uh, Kata introduces another process that is called Kata shim. So this is one. This one is translating the requests that are made by Kahneman or continuer deletion, forwarding them to Kata proxy that goes to the agent and the information flow goes over and over. This is the full picture. As you can see, there are quite some components involved with that. Uh, especially when you are using Docker or ContainerD, you have uh, a, a bunch of processes running because uh, there is Docker, there is ContainerD, ContainerD shim, Kata shim, Kata proxy, Kata agent. So uh, Kata upstream came up with uh, a new um, uh, option, a new binary called ContainerD shim Kata b2 that basically bundles everything in there. So the result is uh, container D is going to talk with, uh, with the shim process that natively knows about how to reach out to the containers that are running inside, inside of the VM. So this is reducing the, the amount of moving pieces, memory usage, uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, there is work being done uh, upstream also to, to get that done for, for cryo. But there is also another option that we're going to, to see on the next slide to get rid of, of the proxy itself. So let's start from the components that are running on the host. You have the runtime, cut runtime. As we said, it takes care of talking with the virtual machine monitor to set up the EMs. It's the one who manages container states. And it's the one who's implementing the runtime, the implementation of OCI. So it's the component that the, the container engine is going to talk about. Kata proxy, as we have seen, is the one who exchanges information between the host and the VM, all right? And it does that usually using a virtual serial. Uh, but if you have a modern kernel, you can use VSOC feature of the kernel that are going to make the whole proxy redundant. So proxy is not going to run, and this component is just out of the picture, so you reduce the number of moving parts. And you don't need a, a really recent version, kernel to do that, so mm -hmm. it's pretty, uh, pretty common. And finally, you have container shim, as we said, is uh, taking care of container reaping, handling standard input, standard output, signal ending, and, and so on and so forth. Instead of the guest, you have a, a virtual machine that is running a trimmed down version of, uh, of Linux. Um, it's using a special kernel that is maintained by Kata. They are pushing patches upstream to the kernel, but some of them are not there, not yet merged. So they or they have special build flags, uh, special configuration. So this is um, a kernel that is uh, sitting on the host and is injected into into the VM at runtime. And you have system DVD spawning Kata agent. Kata agent. This is pretty important. It's uh, taking care of managing the, the, the containers. It start and stop them. And how does it do that? It does that using a library called libcontainer. A libcontainer is a library that is part of OCI as well, and is the library that is used by RunC to create containers. And this is important because basically they are sharing the same code, and the behavior of the container at runtime is going to be really close or equal to, to the behavior of the usual runtime you spawn with, with, with a traditional container engine. So whenever you run your application with, uh, with Docker Podman, blah, 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 you will use RunC, and the application will behave in a certain way. If you spawn it with, uh, with Kata, the, the container is going to be spawned by Kata agent, but Kata agent uses libcontainer, and so the behavior application is not going to be different from, from the usual one. So this is a good thing, less, less unexpected. Uh, surprises for you. So let's talk about uh, the final piece, virtual machine monitor. So Kata has a pluggable backend. It supports different uh, virtual machine monitors. It supports Nemo, QAMO, QAMO Live, Firecracker. And basically what, you, what they recommend to use is QAMO Live, which is a kind of a fork of QAMO. Strip it down to reduce, again, memory footprint, uh, boot time. And it has a couple of accelerators that are all aimed at, uh, at uh, making these containers fast. So booting up a container, it takes around one second or something inside of VM, so pretty, pretty fast. 
Uh, there is a uh, firecracker which is coming up. We have a bunch of slides at the end. It's the new Kilo block, a really cool project. Uh, the guideline is to use QMO well, or QMO Lite if you need extensive hardware support. If you are running microservices, something that has uh, really you know short uh, life, doesn't need uh, fancy hardware support, then you go with Firecracker because it's faster and it is using less resources. So let's talk about storage, which is another important thing. So you are running the container. The container is pulling from the container image. How does the container image get from the host into the VM? So there are two ways to do that. The way that just works is by using a 9P file system. All right, This is working at the file level, which means it's pretty portable, just works as a set, but is not really performant. I mean, it's OK. But if you are looking for better performances, what Upstream is recommending you to do is to use the device mapper storage, which is working at the block level, is providing you better performances. But on the shorthand, uh, you need your container engine to use uh, the device driver uh, graph uh, storage, graph driver storage, which is something that is being deprecated <coughs> by the recent versions of Docker. And there were some changes that also, I mean, even though it's deprecated, it's also got broken with recent versions. So uh, you have to stick with something different, for example, or either an older version of Docker, or uh, Podman, for example, or Cryo. There is also another uh, unexpected behavior. So on a traditional container, when you do a Docker run and you're using run C, you can copy files from the host into the container by using the Docker copy command. And this command doesn't work at all when you're using the device driver. It's a, it's a technical issue. Uh, but hopefully you don't need that. I mean, it's not something common to do. Network. Network is another topic, of course. We need to bring network connectivity to our containers. The way CAD does that is by adopting two different standards. There is CNI, that is used by Kubernetes, Podman, <coughs> Prio, and uh, Mesos. And you have CNM, that is used just by Docker. So to be usable by both platforms, it has to implement both of them. The cool thing is that by using CNI, there is a, a huge amount of CNI plugins available out there to implement different kind of network fabrics. And so you can just uh, use whatever you want. It's a portable concept. Um, the nice thing uh, here that uh, needs some extra words is we have been talking in the beginning about using namespaces, C groups, and seccom profiles to secure traditional containers. Now we are using VMs, but we can mix all the concepts together. This is something pretty powerful. So for example, Whenever you start a container using Kata, the VM will be placed into a network namespace, which is a dedicated one. So we are mixing the different uh, protection technologies that we were already using, and we're using them together with the hypervisor. And this makes everything more secure, of course. Finally, there is one limitation. So sometimes you need uh, to share the network stack of the host with the container. This is something that is dangerous, of course, because it's stripping away an isolation feature. But it is something that, for example, you have to do in some cases. For example, Kubernetes, network drivers, all the CNI plugins running there, they are managing the network stack of the host. And to do that, you have to run them using the same network namespace as your host. Uh, with Kata, you can do that, because all the containers that are running inside of VM uh, and there's no way to share the network stack of your host with the one of the VM. And so, for example, you want to be able to run a Splenol, Cilium, Canal, whatever, inside of the Kata container. But I would say this is fine, because these are exceptional cases that apply to workloads that you actually trust. And so if you trust something, why should you incur into the extra penalty of introducing the hypervisor? We have been talking a lot about Kubernetes. Let's see how Kata integrates into, into the Kubernetes picture. So Kubernetes 
as yet another abstraction. So Kubernetes as a so-called container runtime interface. You have a kubelet, which is the piece of Kubernetes that takes care of running containers, and kubelet is just talking with the container engine. In the beginning, Kubernetes was just talking with Docker, and then thanks to the work done by Rocket, it has been extended to embrace the container runtime interface that allows you to plug into kubelet any kind of container runtime, uh, container engine that as is following this specification. That means that you can have Kubernetes that underneath is using Docker, is using Containerd, is using Cryo, and is just a plug and play. Again, no changes. So, thanks to that, uh, running Kata with Kubernetes is really simple. You just take one of your uh, container engines and you configure the container engine to use Kata runtime instead of RunC. But you can bring it to the next level. And for example, given that Kubernetes supports different container runtimes at the same time, you can define multiple of them. And you can, for example, define a runtime that has to be used for trusted workloads. You define another runtime for a trusted one. And they can both be used by the same node. So on the same node, you can have pods that are trusted, running with RunC, and you have pods that are not trusted and are running with uh, Kata. So you can end up with a really flexible environment, uh, which is made even more flexible by a concept built into Kubernetes starting from 1.12 that recently graduated to be a beta feature with 1.13 release, I think, last week or two weeks ago, I don't remember. With container runtime, in a really easy way, you can define multiple container runtime interfaces. Doesn't mean that you, you have to define uh, Docker, Cryo, whatever. You can, for example, like in this example, I have a cluster that is just using Cryo, but I can use Cryo with different flavors. I can use that with RunC, I can use that with Kata, but using QMU Lite as virtual machine monitor, or again with Kata, but with Firecracker for some workloads, or even further, like I want to use QMU Lite, but with a different set of options compared to this one, like I want to enable a certain machine accelerator, I want to reserve more memory for the VM, I want to use a different uh, storage driver, and so on and so forth. So this is defined by the operator of the cluster. It defines different runtime classes. And then the user can schedule workloads on top of the cluster and say, I want this workload to be running with Kata. I want this workload to be running with uh, traditional run C. But what is probably most uh, useful and interesting is to use uh, a so-called Kubernetes ad admission controller. For the ones who are not familiar with the concept, this is something that is, um, if you enable that, there are several vents. There is one that is called mutating admission controller that takes all the requests that are coming into the cluster in terms of pods, different kinds of resources, and then evaluates them and uh, changes them or leaves them untouched. So for example, I can say as an operator, all the workloads that are scheduled on the cluster by this set of users, I consider them to be trusted and so the runtime is going to be run C. The other workloads coming from these set of users, I do not trust them. And so I will want to, uh, I want to run them with Kata. And what happens is that whenever one of these user, untrusted users, try to schedule something on the cluster, even if they do not specify anything, or even if they want to run with run C, the mutating controller will just override that and say, no way, you're going to run with Kata so that you're wrapped into a VM and everything's going to be more secure. How does it look like? It's pretty simple. As an operator, uh, Kubernetes is made of tons of YAML files, as you have <laughs> probably seen. So you have your YAML file, you define a runtime, and you provide a name, which is what is then being used later on to reference this runtime configuration, and you define an handler. So this is actually the, the name of the configuration file that the, con the container engine is going to look inside of the file system to, to see what is the actual configuration. And then, at the user level, you say, I'm defining a pod, but that applies to, I don't know, deployment, uh, replica set, 
whatever you say inside of a specification, I am going to use a runtime class, uh, this one. And this is all you need. The, this information is then sent down to the kubelet that takes care of spawning uh, the right, um, the right uh, runtime for you. Finally, before we go into a demo session, let's talk a bit about Firecracker. How many of you have heard about Firecracker? Good. All right. So Firecracker is really, really new. When I say the, the new kid of the block is, I mean, is just uh, born in November 2018. It's a project from AWS that, however, has been used in production since quite some time. It's being used by two products of uh, AWS that are pretty used, so it's really battle-tested. One of them is their function as a service uh, offering, AWS Lambda. The other one is their container service. So the, the relevant part here, as you will see later on, is that it has to be really fast and it has to be trusted because AWS doesn't trust, of course, rightfully, the workloads that people schedule on their machines. So it's a virtual machine monitor written from scratch that is leveraging KVM as an hypervisor. In the beginning, it's targeting Intel CPUs, but work is already being done in upstream to support AMD and ARM is on the roadmap as well. So from a security point of view, it is, uh, is really impressive because it's built from scratch uh, to be a really minimal. Uh, for example, the virtual machine it creates it just as a, a keyboard with one button, that is the reset button, that is used to turn off the VM. So it's really stripped down in any kind of aspects to reduce the attack surface, to make it really fast to boot. It's um, designed to execute untrusted code since the beginning, and to do that, they implement different security barriers like SACCOMP that I mentioned before, C groups, namespaces. They have a rate limiting process in place to manage access to network and different kind of resources. And finally, for, for the nerd ones that get excited, uh, I get excited. It's written in Rust, which is a new language that is a low level language designed to be more secure, uh, to be more. Uh, to have less chances to run into memory issues and, and certain kind of exploits. So it's pretty, pretty interesting to see adoption of this language. So again, really fast, memory footprint really, really minimal. It's bleeding edge. It requires a relatively new kernel, 4.14. It works only with device mapper. So you remember Kata can work with 9PFS and with device mapper. But for Kata, you have to use the device mapper, which also brings in the disadvantages uh, of Docker not supporting it, as I mentioned before. And um, finally, uh, Kata containers reacted in a really nice way to the announcement of PyCracker. They uh, pushed out pretty, I think, around Christmas time. So Kata was announced in November. By December time, they pushed out a, a new version of Kata that introduced support for PyCracker. And they are really eager to to make Firecracker the default virtual machine monitor for, for Kata. So, do you have any questions? Should we go into a demo? Yeah. So, uh, virtual, virtualization. Uh, so if I, if I get a VM from Amazon Web or whatever, and then I run Kata container, that's a virtual within a virtual scenario, and it, this is how it, it works? Yeah, so uh, you, you can run Kata and do nasty virtualization. And of course, this is not good. What Amazon is doing for Lambda, Fairgate, they're using bare metal. And this is why it's really important for them uh, that Kata, the Firecracker is secure. This is all the reason behind the paranoia and all the different layers of security. On AWS or on Azure, other uh, major vendors, you can spin up uh, bare metal machines. Like with AWS, you have metal, I wanted to do that as a demo, but I, I saw the price and I said, no, some, someone from management will hunt me down. It's like $5 per hour, so no way. <laughs> but you can do that. You can do that. Mm -hmm. Next. Other questions? Uh, yep. And now Kubernetes supports Windows containers as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a recent announce. I guess that all this is not uh, something that can be 
used on Windows containers? I don't think so, at least not for now. But I'm not really familiar into the how Windows container work. So that could be a selling point for staying with Linux containers. Could be. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. How sensitive are kind of containers to uh, side channel attacks? Oh, I think uh, what was the question? Uh, side channels attack and uh, kata containers are sensitive. They are. It's uh, it's the same. They are in the same bag as all the other hypervisors and such. There's no way you can do that. The problem is down to the CPU, to the, to the hardware. So either you, you introduce all the protections and you have to performance it, or you don't, and it, the code is not so secure. But I, I don't know, maybe they made some measuring. Maybe the impact on them is, is less than unusual hypervisors, but I don't know. Just I think because there are uh, a couple of um, uh, measures uh, to, to, and workarounds to, uh, uh, to counter um, uh, side channel attacks. Uh, classically, the question is, um, it, it is it some of them uh, are working on their level, some of them uh, would depend on the, the hypervisor. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, is there any special situation uh, with the cat containers? I'm not so deep into that to answer, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, uh, device memory issue you mentioned with, with Docker. Mm -hmm. So, is there any solution for that, or does it really basically mean that Kata uh, support for Docker basically and other I, I don't know. Right now, the question is about device mapper and what happens with Docker deprecation. So, I don't know exactly what is going to happen. The deprecation from Docker <coughs> came because. The device mapper graph driver is something from the early days of, of Docker, when the only graph driver supported was uh, A AUFS, which was never accepted into the mainstream kernel. So now that overlay is into the kernel and is working bad, it's working good, and it's the default choice uh, Docker wants to get rid of the device mapper. And this has an implication over to Kata, so I don't think Docker will, will want to keep it around, I'm not sure. Plus. They introduced like um, a regression, and so there was the release of uh, what was it uh, September? The September release of 2018 introduced a regression, and so right now the answer to this regression that breaks Kata is just stick with an older version of Docker. It doesn't have this regression, so it's unsure what is going to happen. Yeah. Um, <coughs> when is it coming to Suze Casp? Oh. This is a good question. Right now, the technology is really in the early days. Uh, if you have some business cases, uh, I would be happy to talk with you about that so we can prioritize that on our roadmaps. But it's not on a roadmap yet? It is on the roadmap, to be fair. Uh, we will probably introduce that as tech preview, but the exact date, I don't remember it right now. And things on the roadmap are, are, are fluid. Can be, they can be pushed forward or, or closer, depending to Business, business needs. Anything else? Okay. The demo itself is uh, is pretty simple. I just want to show you that from a user point of view, there is no big difference in uh, in running something with uh, with Kata or with uh, with uh, with Runcy. Uh, to do that, I'm going to use Podman. For the ones who have not been around today, Podman is really a drop-in replacement of Docker. I made a joke this morning. I started showing how Docker works. And then I told everybody, look, I've not been using Docker. I, I, I really said Docker to be Podman. And Docker wasn't even running. And so it's really the same stuff. Okay. So <clears throat> here I have configuration. Claudio, can you make a little bit bigger for all Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I have a configuration of, uh, of Podman. Um, at the end of it, you can configure several runtimes. Like the default runtime is called RunC. As you can see here, it's my default. So if I do not specify anything, I will just start continuous with RunC. But if I want, I can run containers with Firecracker, which unfortunately doesn't work yet, at least uh, on, on Leap. Uh, or you can run them with QEMU, or you can run them with, uh, these are just uh, 
a different configuration of QAML. So uh, what is happening is that um, uh, Podman is going to execute this binary in order to start the container. And this binary is just uh, a bash script that is calling cutter runtime with different configuration files. So you have a default configuration file over there. This is the, the default one. Uh, I add like a QAMO fast, for example, <coughs> that is using a different uh, cutter configuration that, for example, enables some machine accelerators. <coughs> you can really create as many configuration as you want. And all of this configuration, you can export them into Kubernetes as different uh, runtime configurations, runtime classes. So um, with Podman, you can run the container as, as easy as that. This is a container that was started with Run C. If I want to run the same container with Kata, I just use the runtime flag and I tell it that it has to use uh, Kata. And I'm going to use the QAMO uh, configuration that I created. And here I am. It's up and running. I'm not using the device uh, mapper storage. I'm using 9PFS right now. If I go to another terminal, you can see that I have a QAMO light process running for my container. So everything is actually running with, uh, with uh, QAMO underneath. But as a user, I don't see any, any difference. I can do Podman PS to see all the containers that are running. I can do a Podman exec to open a shell inside of this running container. But this is not going to work, as you can see. That's because Podman is trying to use Run C to create this container, but this container is not uh, nowhere for Run C. Run C can find that. So whenever you have to <coughs> to do some operation on on a running container, you have to specify the runtime again. Oh yeah, my fault. And then what happens is a new container is uh, is spawned inside of the running VM, and I. I forgot to use some options, sorry. Yeah, pretty fast this time. It, uh, because the VM is already running, what happens behind the scene is that Podman is talking with, uh, with uh, the Keta agent, and the Keta agent that is already running inside of the VM is going to spawn a new container inside of the pod where the original container was running. Yeah? Since it's running on a different kernel, you get a different uname output compared to the host? Yes, yes you do. So this is uh, the kernel of, of the guest, and this is the kernel of the host. Yeah, there are different ones. Uh, each kata release has its own recommended kernel, in terms of kernel version and configuration that you have to be using. We are providing packages right now for, for Leap, and we're on OBS, and also for, for SLE. Uh, we provide basically everything from the, from the runtime, the agent, down to the kernel, down to the, to the file system, to the root file system of the image. So the VM is an OpenSUSE Leap VM. There is a Tumbleweed one as well. And it has this, uh, this kernel. So we ship everything, basically. You can do also uh, other regular things. So for example, you can uh, mount a volume. You can mount a volume from the host mm -hmm. down into the container. So here I'm mounting uh, the home of my root user in under the host uh, directory. Wait a second. Ah, yeah, my fault. Yeah. I'm clumsy now. Ah. Before the test. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. 
so it's up and running. And as you can see, it's, it's there. I created this whole file, I remove it. It's gone. It's really the usual experience. You can even go and do something like uh, port mapping. So I'm running this uh, simple application. So I'm exposing a port 4000 of the container over port 5000 uh, on the host. This is up and running. If I go here, it's up and running. The error here is because this is an application that needs to talk with a radius database, but I can access the database. The interesting thing is you can get some, some stuff working. So in this case, this is a web application that needs to talk with Redis. So uh, what, you, what you would do is, for example, this application can, uh, can talk with Redis using a Unix socket. But I have to get the Unix socket of Redis into the Kata computer, and this doesn't work over an IPFS. Uh, for some reason, it's, it's, uh, it's broken. So the only way for me would be to run radius, expose the network port somewhere, and then uh, just access it. But uh, to get something up quick and dirty, I could just reuse the network namespace of my host, so that localhost for radius is the same localhost as the web application, but I can't use the network namespace of the host with the Kata container. And so there are some things that, you know, they don't work, um, and you have to just, uh, you know, cope with them. Um, I would say that, uh, that that would be everything for me in terms of doing, unless you have some more, you know, curiosity to be shown. Um, I have a bunch of final slides. Just give me a second. So there is one dollar billion question, all right, which is Kubernetes and multi-tenants, I mean, uh, this is a common question. I have a cluster, I have multiple tenants, can I use the same Kubernetes cluster for all of them? Can Kata help me with that? The, the short answer is no. I mean, we are getting there, but running multiple tenants on the same Kubernetes cluster is a really complex topic that would need its own dedicated talk. Uh, so we are not there yet. Kata is helping, it's moving us in, in the right direction, but there is still a lot of work to do. Uh, if you are curious about the topic, there is, these are two uh, blog posts from Jesse Frizzell that are describing exactly this specific problem. So if you want to, to learn more about that, take a look at that. And this would be it for